begin. Welcome. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you here today. We have a great set of guests um, and who are doing some very important work. I'm looking forward to our conversation about that. We've been taking a look at COVID since, well, since it began in late fall of 2019. And we've been taking a look at this from numerous angles. We've been thinking about how higher education has changed in terms of pedagogy, in terms of how we care for students, in terms of faculty and staff stress and workload, and not to mention research and all kinds of things. Today's guests have an unusual, unusual approach. What they're doing is they are working on documenting what happened as a result of the pandemic. They're doing a lot of research into this to accumulate stories and building up deductions about what the COVID experience did to higher education. Now, I'd like to hear more about them, but let me bring them each up on stage first of all. We have great people, Tula Delamini, Stephanie Pierotti, and Ruben Puentador. Uh, so some of you may know these people already, but just in case you don't, let me bring them up one by one so you can get a sense of who they are and what they do. So to begin with, let me bring up Tula. Hello, sir. Distinguished panelists and all participants in the forum, Brian, thank you so much. Oh, um, our pleasure, our pleasure, Tula. No. Yes, to the to the audience, uh, my name is, as you've already heard, is Tula Zamini. I was born and bred in Africa, Southern Africa in particular, at a place called uh, Bulawayo, and this is in former Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Uh, it's in Southern Africa, as I've said. Southern Africa is the home of my parents, my grandparents, mm -hmm. and a trailer load of relatives. So I am home in South Africa. Excellent. Excellent. Just outside of Johannesburg, right? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Uh, Tula, the, the way we ask people to introduce themselves is to ask what you're going to be working on for the next year. What are the big projects and what are the big ideas that are going to be uppermost in your mind? Um, quite a, a bag full of, of ideas. Uh, my my background is in in, um, in journalism and writing, and so documenting uh, stories is something that I consider part of, of my DNA. And working with the team at SAU, we're doing exactly that. Except our focus is, is on education and how we can, you know, take a leap from the lessons that that have been learned through the the COVID pandemic and um, so what we have done is interviewed I think by now over 20 individuals who have told us very unique diverse stories about their personal experiences and we are now taking these stories and putting them through an analysis process to find out what is it in those stories that we can learn and, and leverage on in terms of, of solutions. Well, terrific. That sounds like an amazing project. And uh, I look forward to hearing more about this over the next hour. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tula. Let me bring your colleagues up on stage uh, so they can join you as well. Let's see. Let's see if I can find the awesome uh, colleague of mine who people sometimes mistake for me. Um, and so let's just bring Ruben Puentador up on stage. My good friend and hero in the world of education, technology, and world leader in beard growth. Ruben, hello. Hey, Brian. It's good to see you. Good seeing everyone uh, today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I am really you know, honored to be sharing a stage right now with uh, Tula and with Stephanie, and really feel myself very, very lucky to be working with them on this project. Uh, you know, if for those of you who know my work, I work on how technology can make a difference in learning. So that's where the SAMR model and the tech quintet to the models I developed come from. But of late, I've been also turning my attention to the whole question of black swans and anti-fragility. And this project is at the nexus of some of my earlier work, as well as uh, some of that anti-fragility work, which is we really need to understand these stories. And I always have had a fascination with storytelling. 
So from my perspective, we'll talk more about this, uh, being able to better analyze what these stories are telling us, as well as collecting them and sharing them with the world are all part of a package that helps us better understand what happened and better build new solutions, new anti-fragile solutions for what's to come. So that's what I'm looking at for the future, Brian. Excellent, excellent. Black swans, anti-fragility, storytelling. We need more of this. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, and now let me add last, but definitely, definitely not least, let me add your colleague here. And uh, I think a, a chief cat herder of, uh, of events here. Uh, let me bring up uh, Stephanie Pierralti. And she's going to correct me because I probably mangled her name in some kind of bizarre mock Italian. You said it beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're very kind. Stephanie, hello. And Hi. thank you. For you. Uh, you're coming to us from uh, Scarsdale, Arizona? Uh, Scottsdale, yes. We're, I just came from the ASU campus where we uh, did a launch of our Zoom innovation studio. Very cool. But uh, yes, I am the chief cat herder slash co-showrunner and um, uh, ringleader, if you will, of, of uh, Shaping EDU, which is a community of about 4,000 education change makers around the world who work together to help lifelong learners thrive in the digital age. Well, it's terrific. Um, that's a great project. Um, and uh, I really am really glad that you could spare some time uh, to talk about it with us. Stephanie, for yourself, looking ahead for the next year within Shaping EDU, what are the big projects and the big ideas that you're focusing on? Well, we'll announce uh, in the second week in January our five calls to action, which we rally Ooh. around uh, throughout Ooh. the year. And we'll convene in person for the first time since COVID uh, at the end of February of next year. And that kicks off our annual project cycle, which runs from the beginning of March to the end of October. So that will be our big focus, five new projects for 2023. That's a lot. And uh, <laughs> you're, uh, can you tip us off at all? Can you give us any hint about the announcements in January? Yes, uh, we'll, we'll continue some of the, our current uh, focus uh, around digital um, inclusion, which there's a lot of work being done around that, and we'll announce some new projects mm. for that. Um, we're also working on developing the physical classroom of the future and learning environments of the future. Um, so mm. those are will be two areas of focus. And then uh, we're also looking at holistic wellness of educators and of students, so really addressing the mental health crisis. Um, and there's, I'll well, keep two of them secret, but those are, those are our, our big guys. <laughs> Well, thank you for the uh, sneak, pre uh, sneak preview. Um, and let me just uh, show off the visual skills of this platform here and arrange you in a nice kind of 1970s style panel. Uh, uh, I, I have all kinds of questions for you. Um, and, and friends, I'm just going to ask a couple of them just to get the ball rolling. But then I want to get out of the way and let you all ask your questions, too. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, about this group's work, on the bottom left of the screen, you should see a link that says, are we there yet? Um, and then that will uh, take you to their page. Um, so I, I'm just wondering really quickly if the three of you could uh, start off by talking about what are some of the lessons that you think higher education learned from the pandemic period? And what, what, have, what are some of the lessons that your research into this has uh, yielded? I'll let Ruben go first, and then you can popcorn it over to one of us. Happy to. Uh, well, I think one of the lessons, frankly, learned is the fact that it's not enough to just provide a campus and, you know, little boxes where classes take place and lectures take place. You know, the whole question of mental health, the whole question of social emotional learning has come to the foreground in a very deep way. In my conversations and stories that uh, you know, we're collecting, we're hearing this not as an ornament or as an, oh, yes, by the way, we offer this through health services. No, no, it's coming through as a fundamental aspect of what we need to be thinking about. And I would say, if you ask me to choose one key highlight, that would be it. It really is remarkable. And by the way, it's not just higher ed, it's the entire K-20 range. So that's the one I would pick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Just, was, uh, oh, go so, ahead, Tula. Yeah, uh, for me, the number one is 
you know, student engagement for better outcomes. And I, I think this is why COVID-19 was such a dilemma for those amongst us who define student engagement only in terms of face-to-face -face learning. Uh, of course, the other variable related to that is student-centered learning, where you have to start by assuming that every student knows something and that the student, you know, has something to share with other students. And mm -hmm. the technology is an enabler and it's coming out in, this, in some of the stories that we've collected. Excellent. Excellent. I can see how that connects with uh, social learning that Ruben mentioned. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie, that, that brings us back to you. What, uh, yeah. what other lessons did you derive? I think two big takeaways for me were uh, the need for community, um, that sense of belonging to a group of, um, if not like-minded folks, folks to have constructive conflict with and, and uh, discuss issues. And I think also the learn anything from anywhere concept um, that allows learners to embrace new uh, types of journeys in, in learning and um, what does that mean at the end of the day? What, what, what are the micro-credential options? What are stack credentials? How do we put all those pieces together? And uh, I think people now realize that there are many different paths that they could take, um, whereas it might have been a linear journey for them pre-COVID. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, that's very interesting indeed. Those are five very, very powerful and nicely interconnected uh, uh, principles to derive from all of this. Um, friends, I, I want to ask a more material question uh, about this project's work, uh, and then I want to get out of the way and, and hear from you and to see what questions you have. And the material question is, could you, could you say a bit more about how are we there yet uh, functions what do you you know how are you gathering stories where are you finding them from uh tool you mentioned processing them how are you processing them uh, what should the rest of us expect i mean are, are you going to produce a fantastic film are you going to do a series of podcasts how, how are we going to be able to access the results tool you take that one <laughs> <laughs> yes um what we did was um sold the, the idea of collecting the stories to a range of individuals and that included my own daughters who spoke to uh, students that they knew um i also spoke to as a former lecturer at the university I, I spoke to quite a number of my my colleagues that i used to teach with and you know, university administrators who were willing to give us these interviews which we collected and as a team at SAU, um, we also collected a range of stories from a number of people. In fact, each team member collected a story. Uh, mm. And more, as more stories are being collected as, as we speak. Uh, and what we are doing now with uh, about 20 stories, we've uh, started you know, uh, developing the tools which we're going to, to use to analyze the stories. And I think Ruben is, is best suited to, to check that. I'm just, thank you. This is the, the, thank you. That helps a lot. Um, Stephanie, you, you threw that to Tula so quickly. I assume you were uh, about to say something yourself, too. Um, well, you we've published several of the stories. Um, I think we have 13 maybe live right now on our YouTube channel. So if you just go into YouTube and look up um, Shaping EDU, you'll see our channel there and uh, you can access all the stories. So basically the interviews take place over the course of an hour and we um, kind of boil that down to uh, about seven or eight minutes per video. So after um, we, we complete the interview series, um, Ruben and Tula are going to work together on an analysis of these stories told and the key takeaways um, that we'll publish uh, early next year. So that is what, um, what's happening at this moment. Excellent, excellent. And how, how does this all fit within the Shaping EDU enterprise? I think that it's important um, to see representation of different elements of the community uh, from around the world and discussing a common topic, a common problem, and, and looking at how uh, everyone has dealt with those challenges differently. So we can learn by sharing 
Um, the storytelling component of what we do at Shaping EDU is so important. Um, we really want to be able to develop resources um, that could be events, could be interviews, could be white papers, could be toolkits, and to the, for the community to take back to their communities of practice to then share out. And in doing that, that is how we foster change. Wow. I love how that integrates so smoothly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, this is the time for you to put forth your questions. Um, you just learned a little bit about how, uh, how they do their work. Uh, you learned a bit about their major conclusions, everything, the importance of uh, mental health, learning from everywhere, student engagement. What questions would you like to uh, put to our group? Uh, what questions would you like to ask them? Uh, this is the place and time for you to do that. So if you're new again to the forum on the very bottom of the screen, you can click the raised hand button uh, and that'll let me beam you up on stage. And I promise you can see already, in fact, that our guests are very nice. Um, and, uh, and if you would rather type in a question, just hit the Q&A box and, and type that in. In fact, uh, already we're having a good exchange uh, between several people in the chat, between Tom Ames and Kiel Dumsch about um, uh, online education, how this works. Well, people are, are, are thinking about this and, and, and they're starting a couple of questions. I have one more quick question for you. Why are we there yet? What does that question refer to besides the inevitable cry of children in the backseat of a car? <laughs> I think it's a moving target um, to a certain extent, right? Because we we don't want to say in the post-pandemic world, we don't know that we'll ever actually be in a post-pandemic world. Um, so what, what does that look like? And how do we learn from this experience to then uh, whatever the next global crisis may be, how do we uh, take what we've learned from this and adapt it to future uh, situations, which Ruben can speak to as he is the uh, herder of all black swans. <laughs> right. That, I was going to say, yeah, uh, the interesting thing for me is exactly what Stephanie just said, not just say, okay, so this is what happened. Huh, how interesting. We'll write a little book about what happened and that's it. It's how do we use this to learn to move forward? And for instance, the tool set that uh, we're developing for this is all designed to be a open source, what the a European Union calls Libre. So all the software is going to be openly available. The raw interviews are going to be available to researchers. In other words, we want this to not just be, well, we found this out and that's it. But we want this to be a point of departure to explore what happened in light of how we could make the good outcomes be better, maybe apply in cases that have nothing to do with pandemic, but also avoid some of the bad outcomes. And again, not have to have everybody reinvent the wheel, reinvent the tools, but to be able to say, hey, well, these tools work for thinking about this, for developing this, we can just take the tools and use them. And the last point that I wanted to make in this context is for me, there's also a very nice match between the tool set itself and what we're talking about, because we're talking about storytelling. And the tools that we're using to develop the analytical uh, tools for the project is built on what a platform called Jupyter. And Jupyter takes what is a notebook and narrative approach to the integration of data analysis and talking about it. So you're not saying to somebody, well, you go here and you have this data set and you go and you run that program there. And then after that, uh, you write a separate paper and somehow all the pieces, the whole thing is integrated. And as I say, it's designed to be freely shareable with the community. So once again, we're taking a, if you will, data storytelling approach to also telling these stories in terms of how we think about them, both in understanding, but also in terms of what we do for the future. Very nice. Um, I just put a, I'll just put a link to Jupiter in the uh, chat uh, and tweet this out. And speaking of the chat, uh, our good friend Sarah San Gregorio uh, thanks you for acknowledging the pandemic isn't over, especially for me to compromise folks. Agreed. Agreed. Um, uh, we have a question here from uh, um, our, our excellent researching friend, uh, Kiel Dumsch, and let me just bring this up on stage. And again, if you're new to the forum, here's an example of a, uh, of a, text question, if I can hit the correct button. COVID didn't change the obscene prices of higher ed. The catalyst for change in that area will come from alternative forms of credentialing, breaking higher ed's degree monopoly in hiring. So that's not so much a question as an assertion. I 100% agree. And I think that, you know, knowing that the average student 
um, in the States graduates with over $100,000 in debt um, it is a frightening statistic. And it's interesting. I was just in Europe a few weeks ago and talking to um, folks that aren't involved in the education world, that number just blew their mind. And to know now that um, we have a generation of students um, looking at higher ed options and thinking, I don't want that debt. I don't want to go down that road. So if there's something else I can do um, that will still get me the job of my dreams, uh, why would I not do that? So uh, if employers are validating that level of concern and embracing the alternative options for education, um, you know, I think that all schools need to rethink how they're marketing their services to uh, prospective students. And if employers are uh, working in conjunction with higher ed institutions, that's kind of where the magic happens, right? Because then we can, uh, employers are forming relationships with students earlier in the process. And, um, you know, the education institutions are offering broader options that won't require that obscene price tag. Thank you. Uh, that's a really good response. Tula, do you have any uh, insights from the uh, South African point of view? Yeah. I you know, just to add that, of course, you know, as my colleagues have said, the, the problems are bigger. And, but we, we have told ourselves that to achieve useful interventions, we need to understand the real challenges empirically. And that's why we are collecting these, these stories and analyzing. And in, in the preliminary analysis that we've done, some of these challenges around access are already coming up. And we are therefore going to be able to make informed recommendations based on what is coming up. With this space. Oh, good. Oh, good. Very good. Um, Urban, did you want to add anything to that point? No, I, I think uh, that covers it nicely. The, one, the only other thing I was going to say is, again, if we look at some of what happened, what we can learn from during the pandemic and things that work, it's in terms of seeking out these new opportunities or different opportunities, student networks are becoming very, very central uh, to the picture. So it's not just what universities and faculties decide to do. It's also how students come together to share knowledge, decide how they're going to pursue knowledge. And so very, very interesting opportunities opening up on that front as well. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Akil, for the question. Yeah, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of, uh, of a text question. And speaking of which, we have an example uh, question coming up from one of your colleagues. Um, this is from the uh, irrepressible Tom Hims, uh, who asks, what kinds of actionable suggestions for institutions are you seeing so far from your interviews? Let Tula and Ruben answer that since they've been doing the, the interviewing. <laughs> um, I, I think owing to the commonality of the challenge, it's, it's become uh, clear that, you know, issues around access to technology are key and they're universal and they're easily adaptable across different environments. So we have to solve for digital inclusion. It's, it's, it's just one of the priorities that we need. Um, and just come out very clear. I'm, I'm sorry, Tula, I lost your last sentence. Uh, you're pretty quiet. Can you uh, up your volume or get closer to the mic? Yes, um, so I said uh, it, it has become clear that the proposed solutions, um, especially around digital access, mm. are adaptable across different environments. Um, and we really need to solve for this uh, digital access, digital inclusion, because it is indeed an enabler and it's coming out very clear in the interviews that we've done so far. And that's just one of the, 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 the challenges that, that has come up. There are several. Um, we, we mentioned earlier, uh, or it was mentioned earlier, issues around mental health, uh, access to appropriate management systems and how those systems themselves provide opportunities for, for development, making them more, uh, making the user interface more adaptable 
And all these things we need to solve for. And the interviews are beginning to tell us and guide us in which direction we need to be, to be going. And I think this is just to show kind of the, the joints in our work, if you will, um, a lot of these interviews have uh, surfaced the challenges with connectivity to Tula's point. And um, this, this brings us to another part of our work where we're uh, advocating for uh, folks to sign up for the ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Program, and working with the FCC and the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, as well as um, locally, the uh, Digital Equity Institute to make that happen. So um, there's been, we have a, an amazing member, Lisa Gustinelli in Florida, who's run two, um, two programs, one with the Haitian community as an example, uh, where she's gone through the churches to connect with folks that could use the ACP funds uh, to get connectivity and teach them what to do with it what their opportunities are to connect with um, once they have that connectivity. And, and in doing that, we've surfaced challenges with the internet service providers knowing what ACP is and uh, you know who do you talk to? What, once you're approved, where do you go from there? So there's, as it's like an onion, right? So we're peeling away the layers of the onion. Yes, you wanna learn online, but you need affordable connectivity. You need that, you qualify for it. How do you actually get it? So um, I think diving a little deeper is a really important part of the process. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Ruben, you live right on the edge of connectivity yourself. Um, do, do you, do, would you like to uh, add more to, uh, to that theme or another answer to Tom's question? No, I was going to say, it's funny you bring up connectivity because uh, I don't know if, if this is coming through my mic, but I have a steam shovel working outside my house. <laughs> And I have to admit, I'm a little concerned that my loan pipe to the net uh, is at risk right now. But <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, uh, so no, I think uh, Tool and Stephanie did a great job of summarizing that. The only thing I'm going to highlight is just one thing that's less a direct takeaway, more a mode, if you will, which is really listen to what your faculty, your students, your communities are telling you, not what you think is sort of a grand summary. And this is one of the things that sometimes concerns me because I'll, I will see narratives about mental health in the press, but they don't match up, frankly, with what we're hearing in our stories. It's a much more complex and nuanced landscape. I'm a little concerned sometimes that people say, well, I read the story in fill in the blank of your hometown newspaper that you always listen to, therefore I'll design policy around that. And if I had to take away that to say, you know what, listen to the stories really being told because you're going to find that there are very many nuances and very many differences with what sometimes is an, you know, an overgeneralized narrative. And to that point, Ruben, I think it's so important that, you know, we, we can look at stats and we can look at research and we can read articles, but to hear it from the proverbial horse's mouth, what's actually going on, um, with the folks who are boots on the ground, that makes a huge difference. And it, it won't always align. There could be another, um, you know, continuing with my onion metaphor, there could be another layer of the onion that needs to be pulled away to get really to the, the meat of the problem. Can the, can the two of you give us an example uh, of such a case uh, uh, and, and anonymizing the, the, the parties at, to whatever degree necessary, but if, of a, a university listen or college listening and hearing this one outer layer of your onion, if I'm going to completely mangle the metaphors now, um, but instead there is a deeper layer, a deeper message that they should have heard instead. Tula, do you have a good example from your interviews? Tula has been doing a lot of interviews. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, um, it's fair to say, you know, this is early days. Um, we haven't even, Began to do deep dive into the interviews that we have did. Um, suffice to say, when when we have spoken to the people, spoken to the approach has been open ended to allow them to tell us their experience. And and we believe that the analysis that we are about to embark on is going to bring out detail. But for now, uh, we, we, we sit in, it's, it's not a superficial what the interviews are telling us. 
this might be a, a good opportunity for Tom to jump in too, because Tom's been, uh, has conducted several interviews. Well, in that case, let me, uh, I, can, I can easily just draft him up on stage uh, without asking his permission. And uh, let me just clear out some room on the, on the deck so he can join us. And let's see if he can, hello, Tom. Yeah, yes, got you. <laughs> No, I'm not wearing a bathrobe either. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, the interviews have been uh, kind of an interesting experience. I mean, I was one of the interviewees, and then I interviewed a couple of my colleagues at the uh, community college. And it was very interesting to see the range of responses. Uh, one colleague who was teaching art, she was like, oh, it's no big sweat. I was already moving in this direction. And and the way my courses were set up, it wasn't that big of an adaptation based on what I was teaching that. I was already doing a lot online. And then the other colleague was like, I was completely unprepared and mm. it's always been a struggle and and um, um, and getting through, I'm, I'm, he's just not good at getting through to the, you know, in, in that kind of environment. He just didn't feel like he could connect to his students. And uh, it's interesting because the first professor has continued to heavily teach online as I have as well. Um, but the other one has gone back to in-person as fast as he possibly could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, he has a very different mentality. I've known him for 20 years. Uh, he was actually my first boss at the college. And, um, and he has a very different mentality about uh, how his teaching works. And uh, he's, he's certainly more traditional and he's, but he's very good at doing that. It's just that uh, uh, he's kind of toward the end of his career and he doesn't really want to throw everything out and start over from scratch, but he kind of looks at the stuff I'm doing and, and, and goes, mm, okay, that looks interesting. I'm not sure what you're doing, but I get it sort of. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Tom, if, if I can, if yeah. I can focus on that, and, and, and of course, uh, from the rest of the crew, I'd love to hear your thoughts. If that's an, if we can consider that to be an example, an exemplary case, where we've got uh, some faculty who learned to love teaching online, and some who decided that while they could make it work in emergency, it's not for them. What does that tell us about higher ed going forward? Uh, does it mean that we are increasingly bifurcated in, in our our teaching experience with more online uh, does it mean that for the next crisis we're going to have to go through this whole the whole spring 2020 process again or will we be better ready to meet the next crisis you know i think one of the things it tells us is that um a lot of the professional development that we've done toward teaching online has been very technical in orientation it is really focused around this is how you use the learning management system, not what you can do with it or what you can do differently. And I think a lot of times we miss um, having those conversations about, uh, I mentioned in the chat that a lot of institutions miss this too, is that it's a very different environment when you're teaching in an online space as opposed to an in-person space. And it's not always obvious what the differences are uh, until things simply don't work. And one of the things I learned uh, fairly early on is that in an in-person space, I teach very Socratically. That doesn't work. It just really doesn't because you're constantly, you spend half the class haranguing the students to respond to a prompt. And most of them are hiding behind boxes and they don't, you know. So you have to do something a lot more active than that. You actually have to be doing activities in class and that takes more work. It takes more prep work. It takes more upfront thinking about how you're going to get to the same place in a different way. Uh, and those are conversations that I think a lot of times that we don't, even at places like community colleges, which are very teaching focused, we don't have those conversations enough because frankly, it's a lot to ask people just to master the technology or certainly was the case for the last 20 years, especially people who are not terribly comfortable with technology as a whole and all of a sudden, you know, have to somehow figure out. And, they, and of course, there's a, you mentioned in a talk almost 20 years ago, I saw you, uh, these two levels of technology. So in the first level, you basically are copying what you did in the old method in theoretically a more efficient way. And then the second level, you've completely readapted everything you're doing. 
99% or 90, a, a large percentage, 90% of the faculty out there during COVID were barely getting into that first bracket. Oh. And, and they never had the time to stop and go, okay, I'm going to rearrange the deck. I had an advantage in that I had done that from a conceptual level several years before, not because of teaching online, but because I wasn't satisfied with what was working in my in-person classes. And it turned out when I transferred that online that it actually worked pretty well and seamlessly uh, in an online space compared to what other people were doing. And Doesn't to add to that, Tom, I, I think, yeah. you know, one of the reasons that we're looking at uh, game based learning and gamified learning um, and how esports affects that is because the expectation level of the student is much higher for a deeper level of engagement than it was 10 years Ooh. ago, 20 years ago. Um, so what what we as educators were doing. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, isn't going to engage students in the same way. We have 95% of, uh, of kids from 13 to 18 um, that play video games every single day. That's what the, the instant reward and that deep level of engagement is setting a different level of expectation in the student and educators need to adapt to that. So there is going to be a bit of a I think survival of the fittest, if you will, of, of educators that are able to create uh, really engaging, amazing learning experiences for students. And those that are um, you know, perhaps not willing to adapt that technology and, uh, and are, are just going through the, the motions of teaching the same way that they have uh, for their entire teaching career. And I think one of the things with digital is it makes everything very transparent. There's no hiding especially right. for recording things. And I have every lecture, I have it, not lecture, but I have every one of my classes for the last three years on uh, recorded. And, um, and it, it changes a lot. I mean, if one thing you can see everything and you could assume the students can, can go back and look at things too. And, you know, like the other day I, I had, a, had a, I had a really bad day. I just, it just wasn't clicking. It was one of those days when I was pitching, I was, I was uh, Justin Verlander on Tuesday and I was pitching everything best I could and they were hitting it out of the park. Uh, and I was just like, it just wasn't working. But um, I think that one of the things that I would say that I'm not sure it ever really worked. I mean, I, when I went to school, if I remember back on my undergraduate experiences, and I challenge everybody to do this, reflect back on your own undergraduate experiences. Also be aware that you're not typical. If you're in this business, you're not typical. You, yeah. you, you, you like school at some level to, you know, to do. Uh, so your reactions to this are gonna be slightly different than the quote unquote average student. But even with me, um, I remember quirks of professors do I remember the content? I mean, I remember the professor who used to start every day uh, playing rock and roll music in the class. He showed up with cut off shorts and flip flops. It was an astronomy class. Uh, he was very entertaining. Do I remember anything from the class? No. Do I remember the other another professor in astronomy at one point? What he did, he was literally flipping transparencies every 20 seconds or so. And these were crammed with with handwritten text. Mm. And and you just spent the entire time writing as fast and as furiously as you could. Again, do I remember anything from that class long term? Not really. So, I mean, it's, you know, the question is, that's what we've had a lot. You know, that's the that's the education we're used to. We're used to the Kingsfield method of teaching. And, you know, uh, and, you know, one of the problems, of course, is that when we start changing the modalities where this is not hidden around in four walls, People start to see that and then they go, well, wait a minute, what exactly are you doing here? You know, and think about where your actual learning comes from in college or otherwise. You know, where, where does that actually, uh, where does the stuff that's stuck, you know? Now, skills and things like that, yes. Methods of research and learning and, and, and scholarly inquiry and things like that, certainly from grad school. But um, content, uh, especially in undergrad, you know, not so much, you know. So, so there's a lot to be said there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, Tom and, and Stephanie, between the two of you, what you're describing is a professoriate that seems to have improved marginally uh, over the course of, of the COVID experience. And in the chat, we have uh, affirmations for this from uh, Lisa Durf and Sarah San Gregorio. Um, 
but that we haven't advanced far enough uh, either to do what we need to be done now sufficiently or to take care of the, the next crisis. Um, this is the after all the future trends form and we look at the future of higher ed. So Ruben, let, let me ask you to do a little, a little forecasting, perhaps a little scenario. If, um, how do you think higher education is going to respond to the next, uh, maybe not necessarily COVID level, but something substantially dangerous, uh, such as, you know, we, we can pick a few of these, uh, a few of these disasters. How, how do you think we're going to respond? Are we going to rerun spring 2020 or are we going to do something a bit different? It's a great question, Brian. I'm not sure, to be honest with you, that, so the good news is I don't think you're going to see somebody just replicate, uh, you know, what happened at the beginning of the COVID pandemic and that's it. So I think some lessons have been learned. So that's the good news. Uh, but let's take it from the perspective of, for instance, uh, climate change, just to, let's, let's put it a little bit more concrete, right? So if you're looking at the type of scenarios, I think there's going to be a learning curve for adapting some of the lessons learned to a different type of scenario. So for instance, you know, people learned that they had to go remote uh, because of uh, issues of contagion with COVID, et cetera. But uh, climate change could push you in the other direction. Climate change might push you to a point where, in fact, a, the learning space becomes a sheltered space. So the question becomes then, which lesson have you learned? Because uh, whatever you learned about how do you Zoom probably isn't going to be directly applicable. But this goes to a question that Tom was bringing up, which is thinking about how the spaces work, thinking about how to think about that. I, I'd like to think that things are a bit further along the issue of technology, which was brought up uh, by Tula, you know, the issues of, you know, how that technology is mediated, connectivity brought up by Stephanie. I think all of these play into the picture. So if I had to make any sort of forecast, I'd say, uh, probably hiring isn't going to get it right at the next major challenge. Probably you're going to see lots of mistakes, lots of missteps, but I think a few fewer. And my hope is this type of project that we're doing will help people say, hold on, I don't, we don't have to re reiterate or re-replicate everything we did wrong with COVID or all the errors we made. We can at least make new and exciting errors, but hopefully a few fewer. Off. I mean, that, that's my take. I, I welcome to hear you know, from the rest of you what, what do you think on that front. New errors. Well, that, that's, from, that's from the Black Swan Herder. Uh, uh, I'm curious, Tulu and Stephanie, what do you think? I mean, based on all these stories, what, um, what do you, how do you think higher education is going to respond to the next COVID? Yeah, one of the things that um, some students have told us is that it was not all gloom and doom. Um, not every student had a challenge with access to, to technology, for instance. Um, although that, that, that position is not evenly distributed. Um, but they say that, you know, uh, having to learn from home and, and not going to class meant that there was no peer pressure for them, for instance, uh, that they could study from wherever they were in the world, um, that there were no compulsory extramural activities for those who didn't like them. Uh, they had freedom to organize their own time, decide when to study, what to study. Um, and some of them said they, they preferred the, the online exams. Um, they, they say they were less anxious. They just wake up, prep, sit on a desk. And this is different from regular school. So there, there are all these things that we are learning from that we think somehow they we can find ways of leveraging on them. Thanks. Good, good point. I remember seeing studies which showed uh, all kinds of interesting virtues to uh, what was then emergency online instruction uh, to people who were suffering from social anxiety. Uh, being in a, in a crowded lecture hall, for example, well, being online uh, didn't give them that necessarily. Uh, some people who uh, in the K through 12 space were reporting social problems such as bullying uh, found being online was a lot better. Um, and of course, uh, there's the uh, environmental change that uh, people are not burning CO2 as they travel from to uh, universities and, and campuses. 
I think it's really important to thank you for, for sharing that, that there, there are really positive, uh, positive lessons that we learned as well. Um, friends, what other questions do you have? Uh, we only have about 10 minutes and I, I can't even finish that sentence before someone asks a good question. Uh, and this is from uh, Charles Finley, uh, our good friend who says, uh, any international global initiatives addressing access? Students are attempting to write required essays on phones and trying to meet day deadlines with no electricity for a day or two. Change the requirements? What do you all think? I think it will continue to, to be a problem, um, especially as we struggle with how we adapt to climate change. Um, but you know, I think this first step of getting more people connected with the ACP um, will be very telling and in, in what is, what's the norm, right? What's expected? How do we get more folks access to, to online education? Um, but it is creating a digital divide and, and it's up to us to try to close that. And again, the ACP, that's the United States uh, FCC uh, effort to give some financial assistance to people who don't have Exactly. Care. It's it's a, basically a stipend, um, you know, just something to help ease the burden of the cost. They don't cover 100 percent of it. Um, I apologize if I get these numbers incorrect, but I think in the tribal nations, it's a $70 a month um, supplement. And then uh, it's either 30 or 35 for other folks. So just having that as um, you know, something to help is important, but also making sure that our libraries are being put to good use. You know, we, we do have a lot of resources available at, at libraries that um, aren't, aren't always utilized. So making sure that that's yeah. open and accessible is really important too. I mean, I'm, I'm the facilitator here, so my job is not to and answer questions, but to, to ask them. Uh, I, I would just say one of the great takeaways from uh, from the pandemic is the massive realization of the digital divide at a worldwide level. Um, just just how thorough that is and how unaddressed it is. Please, someone started answering, and I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, uh, just a very quick thing uh, because I went to to Charles' point. There's something very important that comes out of what Charles said because uh, Charles mentioned international aspect and that to me is really important because there is work being done internationally some under the auspices of unesco some under the auspices of international ngos etc all sorts of different organizations and it's important to learn from them a one of the points for instance being brought up which is so students are arriving on cell phones etc we actually have good research that's been done on that front from unesco from japan uh from uh, several other locations that say no of course you don't say let's get a traditionally formatted essay out of this but it is a way of saying how do you readapt or re you say what is the purpose of this task and then can i rethink it readapt it etc in the context of that technology which is available which happens to be robust in the face of a technological challenge whether it's you know a flood due to a hurricane or, or what have you. So absolutely, Charles, uh, the point you brought up in your question as to the international aspect of uh, these initiatives is really a crucial one. And again, if you ask me for a strong encouragement, you know, for me, for instance, it's a joy to be able to work with, with uh, Tula, but I would expand that to it's a joy to be able to work internationally and to share with colleagues from around the world their solutions, their ideas, and to be able to look at this work. And that's part of, you know, the, the amazing, you know, the special sauce of having a community like Shaping EDU is that we do um, offer global perspectives and we hope to be able to say, OK, um, our friends in Sweden, how did you deal with connectivity issues there? What can we learn from you that we can take back um, to our communities of practice in the States? And um, the more of these conversations we have with a broader um, the broader community, the more solutioneering we can do together. Stephanie, in your capacity as director, I, I, I just want to put a bug in your ear. I would love to host um, your uh, broadband access group here. Um, uh, and we can follow up by email perhaps, but... Uh, yes. Um, no, though the only thing is at least one of those people has to have an impressive beard. I mean, that's just got to be a... a 
Ruben, are you, you're in that group, huh? <laughs> oh, that's easy. Uh, yeah, but we need we need to diversify. I think we need to encourage more uh, members of the group to. Uh, <laughs> I think that's right. Um, in in the chat, on a, on a more serious that's note, that's a pretty clean shaven group, actually. <laughs> think about it. Well, uh, we don't want that. Um, that's always a sign of troubled characters. Um, in the in the chat, uh, Susan Klausmith uh, reminds us a more serious note. Uh, there are still people impacted by recent storms, uh, Fiona and Ian here in the Southeast US, struggling to reconnect their lives in general, not to mention stay on track with their education. Uh, and again, looking ahead uh, as the climate crisis worsens, and that means we have a greater incidence of such storms and those storms will tend to be of greater destructiveness. Uh, this sounds like something that we really uh, need to focus on in higher education and we need to be well prepared for. Charles, thank you for that excellent question. Uh, and, and each of you, thank you for those answers. And I, uh, and I think, you know, getting back at what Ruben said a minute ago, is that one of the things we need to learn from the pandemic, as well as the, you know, the, the potential interruptions of the futures, we need to be looking really carefully at what, how our, what our tasks are, you know, what we're trying to do when we're teaching. And, and create a flexible framework that allows us to slide from virtual to in-person, depending on what makes the most sense, not only given the circumstances of the time, but also given the learning needs of the learner. I mean, some things are just better taught in person, some things are better taught online, and we don't tend to think critically about which falls into which bucket and or what are the trade-offs in, you know, in this environment versus that environment. Um, there are many things I've lost teaching online that I would love to recapture, but my school does not really have a very fluid hybrid environment. You're either online or you're in person. And um, sometimes it's 50-50, but that means you're online half the time and in person half the time. And it's not 55-45 or whatever you need it. It's 50-50. That doesn't make sense. That's arbitrary. And it's based on the antiquated industrial learning systems that we've built up. And that, you know, one thing that COVID has hopefully taught us, at least that first year, that first semester especially, is how can we be flexible and fluid? Although one thing I will, re I do remember from quite a few institutions having these conversations in, in the spring of 2020, there was, a, there was occasional discussion about why don't we extend the semester into the summer? Mm -hmm. almost always got killed mm -hmm. because God forbid we mess up the graduation date or something mm -hmm. like that. What difference does it make if you graduate on May 31st or June 31st or June 30, June 31st, June 31st might be a little of a problem. That could be like a Trump university certificate, but uh, June 30th. Um, but yeah. So, I mean, but that's, that's the kind of thing where you start getting into these fundamental systemic things of time and how we think about time and structure. Of course, we also get into this question of some students can learn this material in 16 weeks, some need 18, some need 19, some need 12. How do you, how do you, you know, adapt for that? You just fail all the ones who need extra time, right? That's what usually happens. And then the ones who don't need as much time get bored. It's this arbitrary 16 week limit, you know, yeah. these are all things that we didn't play with and yet we we're scared to. Let me, and let me we don't do that, but yeah. Tom, because, because that's an incredibly important point. And we did see a lot of uh, churn, a lot of innovation on scheduling and, and taking a, a hard look at this. In fact, at the forum, we hosted a couple of uh, guests who spoke about this. Um, one group at uh, uh, Small Liberal Arts College redid their calendar uh, into smaller chunks. Uh, and we've also hosted uh, Eddie Maloney and Josh McKim, who've spoken about the sheer variety of institutional uh, creativity. I think that's another thing that we need to remember. Don't forget about Dean Dad and what oh, he was doing. We never forget about Dean Dad. Uh, Matt Reed is brilliant. But I wanted to ask you all, if I can ask you all one last question, if I can pull together, pull together a few different strands here. Um, uh, and one is, uh, Tula, you mentioned the importance of student engagement. Ruben, you spoke about uh, the faculty duty, really, to uh, redesign their teaching once the computing environment has changed. And, uh, and Stephanie, you've been speaking about the difficulty of trying to get students engaged with educational technology when they're already hyper engaged through social media, gaming and other tools. Um, what did you what did we all learn from this experience about instructional designers and instructional design? 
did instructional designers come to the forefront of how we teach online? Um, or what else did we learn about the, the profession and the function of instructional design, instructional designer? I can speak from an ASU standpoint of uh, being part of the learning design uh, experience team, making sure that their the professors have uh, access to uh, tools from learning experience uh, from point A as quickly as possible and learn in their education process, their own education process, how to utilize those resources. Um, I, I think it's become really critical to the, the success of educators. I mean, I have to admit to being biased. I teach in a master's degree program for instructional designers. So I'm like, good, good, good. Yes. But, but, but please, please uh, tell me more. Tula, what, what do you think? Is, are you seeing more interest in instructional design in South Africa and elsewhere? Um, I think for, for us, it, it's been our first goal has been to collect the stories, really, and to avoid preconception around what the problem might be. Mm. Of course, uh, there is preliminary data which, which indicates uh, that digital technologies and access are an issue. Um, but we, we, we need to, to delve deeper into the stories that we are getting and, and to speak to more administrators and, and hear from them. They must tell us. Um, because if we, we approach this investigation with preconceived notions, then we might miss the, the, the story behind the story. Mm. So um, this is mm. where we are at, at the moment, um, but um, hopefully uh, the data we are getting takes us to a deeper dive within time. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the story collection. Thank you. Ruben, on that story note, did you want to add anything? No, I think Tula has summarized the point uh, accurately. I think uh, we are seeing some instances, for instance, of what I would call a deepening and, and engagement in some in institutions of re-engagement, but it's early to tell, you know, what the overall profile has been from a personal perspective. You know, I, I couldn't agree more, you know, about the, the crucial importance of getting instructional design, you know, at the forefront of thinking about what, of what happens next, as well as, say, a certain, for lack of a better word, having uh, instructional design permeate faculty practices. But uh, I also agree with Tula 100% in terms of what actually has happened during the pandemic, where we've seen instructional design play a key role where we haven't that's part of what we're trying to find out. Okay, thank you. Thank you all, um, both for the answering my, my bizarre last question, but also for being just fantastic guests. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, all of you. Uh, Tula, Ruben, Stephanie, and, and Tom, uh, what's the best way to keep up with your group? Are we there yet? Well, we do have uh, weekly meetings that we, we welcome folks into. If you go to the shapingedu.asu.edu site, um, that's a great place to connect with us. And also going into our YouTube channel, our Shaping Edu YouTube channel, um, to actually watch the, the interviews there. Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, we've gone over the, the end of our hour, so I need to pause. But uh, once again, Tula, Ruben, Stephanie, even Tom, thank you so much. Um, thank you for, for all this work, and please keep doing it. Um, and uh, we'll we'll circle back and, and catch up with you. Thank you all, and be well. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. But don't leave yet, friends. Um, I've got to uh, let you know what's happening next uh, on the next few sessions of the Future Trends Forum. And um, I want to thank you all for your questions and comments. And by the way, if you would like us to do more sessions on uh, on this topic of what we learned from COVID. There was some interest in the chat there, and I'd be I'd be happy to do more. Um, so, if you want, keep talking about this. Uh, you can use the hashtag FTTE on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brian Alexander or at Shindig Events, or you can hit up my blog at BrianAlexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, again, we did a, quite a few sessions in COVID. Just go to tinyurl.com/ftfarchive. 
if you want to look at what else we're talking about, we're covering everything from how to reimagine higher education to campuses and local inequality to free speech, black students in debt. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us for more. If you have any of your own projects that you want yourselves to celebrate, uh, Sarah, you mentioned uh, an article of yours. Shoot me a note so I can tell everyone about it. And above all, everybody, good luck working uh, as we work our way through October here in the Northern Hemisphere. We're getting cooler and darker. I hope everybody is succeeding well. And above all, I hope you all take care and are safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>